everybody is very much acquainted, uh, acquainted with the name Regina Gill. Uh, I think that uh, she does, I, my first met Regina, and I don't know if she remember, but, but when at uh, Temple Israel, when we first came, we came in 76 too. When we first came, um, I saw somebody, very talented person was making a mural in the in the school and it was, it was awe inspiring and uh, I thank her for it. And that's why I knew from the very beginning that she was a very talented woman. And uh, not only a very talented woman, but a very practical woman who could put together, I mean, not only got ahead ideas, but got things done. But I had no idea at that time how much that's true. But I think everybody here now will know the name Regina Gill and will certainly know the name of the, uh, the Gold Coast um, Arts Center. And uh, if they don't know that, if they're really old like me, they remember the Great Neck Arts Center. And I'm going to leave it to uh, Regina to say, to explain why it was changed, which always I kind of interested in. I can only think that that's a sign of success. And, um, but Regina comes, she has a, she has an art background and uh, she has a, a local, some local um, uh, schooling. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about it except that I, there is really no introduction necessary that I am absolutely flabbergasted from an idea that, that, uh, that occurred to her single-handedly that uh, before you is the most professional. And I know she probably, I think I, I, I read that she would like to expand, but I mean, I think what she has accomplished uh, both in physical and in, um, and in artistic uh, terms is, is astonishing. And I don't even, I'm sure somewhere there is some, someone else who could have done that, but I have to say here that she truly from nothing created a wonderful, uh, a, a both educational and uh, entertainment uh, system that, that has actually put, I think, Great Neck on the map. And so I am not, I know that she's not gonna be modest and say it was nothing because it was tremendous. Oh, it wasn't nothing. It wasn't <laughs> nothing. Oh, you know, I, I'm not <laughs> stupid. That's not, it was a labor of love, but it wasn't <laughs> nothing. Okay, that's exactly what I wanna hear. So Regina is going to tell us the history of the Gold Coast Art Center. And she's going to, uh, I, I think along the way, uh, make you as astonished as I am, because I think that it could happen from, wouldn't it be nice to what we have here today? And what, what she expects that's going to happen in the future, what she hopes mm. is going to happen in the future. And being Regina Gill, I think it's more than hopes, it's going to happen, that's all. So if we can help in any way, certainly by attendance, uh, uh, joining, certainly, uh, going to the website to get information and going to the performances uh, and uh, making sure our family takes advantages of a, a really um, unbelievable uh, array of uh, classes and uh, uh, shows, not only, uh, and uh, art art shows. And I can't films. even, not, not, oh, it's, oh gosh, yes, certainly films. And I think that's, Yes, that's a tremendous. I think that's really a star, and I know in your in in your in your crown, but that but that's that's amazing. So uh, please start with uh, where did this come from? Where and how did it happen? Yeah. I'm going to start by thanking you, Rona. That was quite quite a tribute. I appreciate <laughs> that. Just when I thought that nobody noticed, <laughs> <laughs> because. Um, this this is something, it truly was a labor of love. And um, for those of you uh, who don't know, the art center was the old art center that existed in Great Neck from 1950, I wanna say 51, until it closed in 1980, maybe 81. Um, that art center was called the North Shore Community Art Center. 
And it was the reason that I moved with my husband, that I chose Great Neck ah. um, over other communities on Long Island because I had two small children and I wanted a cultural center where I could bring them to get music and art and dance and all the other things that were important to me. It already had uh, good schools, it had temples, it had shops, it had everything else. But for me, a good community needed to have a cultural center. Um, unfortunately, and, and by the way, the first thing I did when I got here was I, I ran to that center, which was, if you don't know, where Young Israel exists now, used to be for 30 odd years, the home of the North Shore Community Arts Center. Um, so ran over there, volunteered immediately, signed up my kids and uh, enjoyed maybe two or three years before in their infinite wisdom, they, um, they decided to sell the property because there was a big real estate burst and they were able to get what they thought was a lot of money, which today it's like should have held on to it um, and sold it. So, and then it closed and I believed that Great Neck, a community like this one, would not allow such a thing to languish, that we would have a replacement or it would reopen in some other form or some other location within Great Neck, and it never did. So um, I just want you to, uh, to know something about my background so you'll know why I, I got involved in the first place. Um, I was born in Germany. Uh, in a, my parents are Holocaust survivors and met in the camps and married in the displaced persons camp where I was born. And we ended up, you might mention Texas before Rona, we ended up in San Antonio, Texas oh. by a circuitous route. And um, then eventually made our way to New York where I was educated. And I believe to this day that my lucky break and the break for all of us who were growing up within the boundaries of New York City's five boroughs was that I could go. We all had different talents and different um, intellects, but those of us who were interested in the arts had lots of choices. So I ended up going to the High School of Music and Art, which um, was then later on in life combined with the High School of Performing Arts to make the LaGuardia School for the Visual and Performing Arts, which exists on the west side. At that time, it was up in Harlem across the street from City College. So. I consider those years that I had in, in, it was, you take a little girl who came to America not speaking English and loving to draw, loving to just, and fortunately my parents being European encouraged it. And so I always had, even though there was no money, always had materials. There was no room for a piano. There was no room for, and money for a lot of other things, but there's always room for a pencil. So I um, got into the high school. It was the Camelot of my educational life, no matter how many other degrees I later secured. It was, to me, that was the foundation. And I'm one of the few people I think who still lists my high school in my resume. Having said that, we fast forward. I then got my college degree, my master's, blah, blah, blah. Got married um, to my husband, uh, Joe Gill. And no, he's not the clerk of Great Neck village of Great Neck. Um, he is uh, from Israel and we came to Great Neck in 1976. And so what I thought, once that other art center had closed, I thought that you know, somebody has to, has to fix it. Somebody has to make it happen. So at that time, I was very good friends with uh, the mayor, then mayor of Great Neck Plaza. And his name was, is still Robert Rosegarden, although he's not the mayor any longer. But uh, he was, he, he was, uh, and I'll remains in my mind. Sorry? Excuse me. Ellen? Yes. I, I, was that your, I'm sorry, I don't know if it was used, but somebody's um, not muted. All it's right. Okay. Go ahead. Anybody can jump in. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think he was talking to us. Please don't have any conversations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in any case, Bob Rosegarden, we had, it, for me, it was, um, it was a, a terrific lineup. You had Bob Rosegarden, the mayor of Great Neck Plaza. You had Leonard Szymanski, the mayor of Saddle Rock. Of Saddle Rock. You had Richard Aranella, who was the um, superintendent of parks. And you had, um, you had 
just other leadership. Oh, and, and most of all, best of all, with all due respect to the others, was Tom DiNapoli, who was our uh, legislator, our assemblyman representing our district. Uh, I had connections to the Great Neck Schools. And so when there was, for example, in 1994, prior to my founding the Art Center, I had already gone around to the various and sundry leaders and said, I don't understand. I'm an artist, I'm an art teacher. I don't understand why this community uh, can't support an art center to be restored to it. And, and I, I you know, did my homework. Um, this community had such a rich cultural legacy. I don't know how many of you know that Joan Crawford lived here with her last husband. She lived on Station Road in that big house on Station Road. Uh, Sid Caesar, Martha Ray lived down the street from where I live. Um, you had Sid Caesar, Groucho Marx, even Paul Newman was here for five minutes. You had, of course, Alan King, who lived in the house that he bought from Oscar Hammerstein II, from that, which is now no longer there because the new owner in their infinite wisdom decided to raise it to the ground and build up you know, another mansion. So uh, in addition to that, of course, F. Scott Fitzgerald in, in Great Neck Estates, Frank Lloyd Wright's house that he had built, a residential house in Great Neck Estates. Um, Charlie Chaplin lived with um, Paulette Goddard in her uncle's house in Great Neck Estates. I mean, we could go on and on and on about all the performers, the writers, um, Ring Lardner, uh, all, all of them who, who came here to Great Neck and lived here. That's not even counting Port Washington, Manhasset, Roslyn and beyond. That's just Great Neck. It was, it was uh, an amazing community. So it was no wonder that a group of them got together uh, in the 1950s a Tully Filmis, a great artist, great Jewish artist. If you don't know his work, you should, he's in the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, his wife, Gladys, who was a dancer, um, a host of other artists of that caliber. Helen Frankenthaler taught in this town, Louise Nevelson, her altarpieces at Temple Bethel. The reason for that is because she taught in Great Neck Adult Ed. You have, you have all kinds of connections to, oh, Twyla Tharp came here to do a performance. When Meryl Streep was still a student at Yale, she came down to do, um, I don't remember what her piece was, but she was performing in college uh, at the time in a show called Alice, uh, which she then, I mean, the list of talent is astounding. So I went to Tom DiNapoli and I said, listen, here's my narrative about this community. Um, it's the first time I've ever lived anywhere uh, for more than five minutes because my family were constantly moving. And I, I think that I would help anybody who has a business background who would like to help me may, or who would like to initiate this and, and bring it back. So Tom DiNapoli went up to Albany with my narrative and came down in 1989, came down with a check for $10,000 and said, here, this is receipt money. And I said, what, what? <laughs> He said, yes, I think that you should use this money to make this happen. I said, but Tom, he said, no, no, I'm here. And I know Bob will help you and, and Richard will help you and the mayors will get together and we'll do presentations and form a board. And um, I leaned on every friend and, and of course my husband who had business background to, uh, and a lawyer, one of my friends who was a partner in a law firm uh, did the pro bono work to incorporate this new entity which I named the Great Next Center for the Visual and Performing Arts, Inc., a mouthful, which then got shortened to the Great Neck Art Center, which is how we did business until later on, when, uh, which is now seven years ago, when we realized that we were not just a Great Neck organization, we were now a regional organization. So we renamed ourselves Gold Coast Art Center. Uh, and of course the offshoot, the Gold Coast Film Festival. But more about why we're the Gold Coast in a minute. Uh, Rona wanted to know how this happened. You're going to get the story. So uh, we, um, I, I had five points that I needed to cover in order to, to create what I thought was the plan. We needed an architectural rendering of what an art center should physically look like. Uh, we had a business plan. So you were supposed to make a five-year business plan. Where, do, where are you now and where do you want to be in five years? So did that. 
we had, um, we wanted to do a marketing survey. So Bob Rosegarten hooked me up with a marketing company that had done research for the village of Great Neck Plaza um, to see how, why shoppers do or don't shop in Great Neck. What were the reasons? And so they created this whole questionnaire. And I don't know if anybody listening here today got this questionnaire, but they sent it out in 1994 uh, to everybody on this peninsula. And one of the questions that was asked was, would you support an art center in your community to the tune of $100 a year? And believe it or not, in 1994, we got a significant enough percentage say yes, that everybody, along with all the other questions that were answered in the top box of yes, you know, excellent, very good, good. Those are your three top box answers. So we, everything was top box. We really, we really were encouraged to believe that this could happen. So um, I had a friend who owned an advertising agency and this is what happens, Rona. You think that you, you just need the power of one person to be a pain in the neck. And I basically leaned on every friend I ever had who had a skill or, or a business or, or information or expertise that I didn't possess. Um, and I leaned on them to help me, to just teach me. And my friend Ralph Hyman, uh, who's married to Michelle Hyman, who's a retired, um, wonderful, gifted, retired teacher in this district. Uh, Ralph was the first treasurer, remains the executive vice president and treasurer of the Art Center to this very day. Michelle uh, is a wonderful educator, helped me found my school and remains the recording secretary to this day. Uh, so basically Ralph taught me how to, I, what did I know? If I could balance my checkbook, I was really excited. So now I had to start managing a budget of a not-for-profit and I had to be legally, fiscally responsible. So there was a lot that went into this nucleus um, of a thing, but the, of, a, of an art center. Mayor Rosegarten appointed me the commissioner for cultural affairs in Great Neck Plaza. They had never had a commissioner or a commission for cultural affairs, but he felt that it would give me more status as I went around to appeal to politicians in the region to support it. So to this day, I am the, culture, <laughs> the commissioner for cultural affairs um, in Great Neck Plaza. Um, in addition to that, in May 1994, he dedicated the month to, uh, to Great Neck Art Center. And he said, this month will be a, day, a month dedicated to the arts. As a result, we had every single day, we had a cultural event that took place somewhere else. We didn't have a building, we didn't have a space, we didn't even have a basement. But what we went around and we rented, um, we were starting to rent money off and fundraising. So we got somebody to help with that. And we wrote letters and we got, we raised $12,000 in the course of, um, I think it was a month due to a letter. There, was a, there were a lot of people living here then who were aware that, that we were missing that art center, that it had been many years at that point so we had, it was about 15 years later. Um, Shirley Romaine was um, the former president of, of the previous art center. And, and she was very reluctant. She, was, she wasn't trying to rain on my parade. I spoke at her funeral. Um, she was just trying to make me aware that the previous one failed. Why was I going to knock myself out to try and bring it back? So I said, I, just will learn from you what happened, what was what went wrong, and why do you think you failed? And so she joined my board, and remained on my board until her death. Um, and she was she was sort of the bridge as a human. She was the bridge between the previous art center and the previous generation, and this one. So um, there was a historical legacy that we were able to integrate into the new art center as well. So here we go. So we have an art center whose mission statement legally, now that we were incorporated, says the goal, now it's the Gold Coast Art Center is dedicated to promoting and supporting the arts in then Great Neck, now the community uh, through education, exhibition, performance, and outreach. Uh, to that end, we will present art, music, dance, theater, and film uh, in and every permutation thereof. 
uh, in a variety of ways through our, as Rona put it, the gallery, the art gallery, which is not a museum. These are living artists who want to sell their work or at least have their work seen and appreciated. And we have um, receptions for them and people can come, it's free, everything. We try to have everything as free as possible, even though it's not um, a tax-based organization. Uh, we are a not-for-profit. And so now we have the School for the Arts, which serves everyone, as I like to put it, from womb to tomb. We have babies all the way up to seniors and everything in between. And it's been quite re remarkable to see uh, the kind of participation we have since we're not limited to South High School, North High School, South End of Town, North End of Town, um, um, Ashkenazi Jew, Sephardic Jew, Christian Jew, didn't, doesn't matter, Persian, uh, Chinese, we have probably got the most diverse representation of all the residents of this community um, outside of if you combined all the schools because uh, the schools are themselves representative of different uh, neighborhoods and regions in our on our peninsula. Through the um, through the film series, we realized we had latched onto something because uh, my feeling about it was that film, anything, any art form is more enriched if you can have a conversation about it. Some of my favorite memories are the conversations that I had with professors during my art training. And as a result, I, I mean, I took dance and and film and theater and, and uh, as well as all the arts. And um, it's, it's much more meaningful when you've seen a film and don't you ever have that feeling afterwards? I really wish I understood why they did that or I don't know if I like that film, but then you stay for the conversation and you talk to the producer or the director or the actor who's in it or the screenwriter or the man who did the special effects, or, or the ambassador from the Czech Republic whose film we've just screened, or well, all of these things that we've done. And suddenly it's possibly through this conversation, which we always open up for a Q&A, possibly through this conversation, it's more illuminating. Same way, same reason you do book clubs. You want to talk about a book. And if you hated the book, you want to know why somebody else liked it. And maybe that will help you process what you read in a different way. Um, it's always easy to talk about a book you liked. It's much harder to try and examine the book um, from a different filter. And that holds true for artwork. I taught a class uh, in adult ed for a long time ago called um, uh, Post-World War II Modern Art. And it, and it, was, it was basically, it was an attempt and it was very well attended. And it was an attempt to help people not be afraid of modern art, of abstraction and non-objective abstraction. And, and uh, starting from 1948, 45 to 19, I think we went up to 1975. And following each class, we would do a lesson, an art lesson, where they would actually create an artwork based on what they had just learned. And that's a format that we observe even today in the art center in certain classes with children. You should see what children can do when we teach them what, um, what Picasso and Brock were able to do with cubism. Or, or um, we have one class of seven-year-olds who created this 48 by 48 painting all together as a group that looks like a Jackson Pollock because they learned drip painting. And and we actually sold one. As we said, well, wait, these are children. No, 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 I like it. It'll really look good over my sofa. And this person paid and made a donation with the permission of all the children, um, made a donation to the Arts Center of $300 and bought that, ch that child's work. It's been exceptional to find out. We have one teacher, for example, who was an art teacher. And on my office is across the hall. And for those of you who don't know where the Art Center is, it's behind, it's behind the movie theater. Uh, we have an awning on Middle Neck Road next to the movie theater, the late great movie theater. Um, but around the corner in the Maple, uh, Maple Road, parking isn't it? Lot. Parking lot. That's our front entrance. So if you want to come in, it's free. Not today. Today you have to actually call to get a, an appointment because of COVID, but we're hoping that the world will open up again and then you can just come and go. But um, I saw this teacher, she was a new hire, 
And I looked across and everything is glass. And I looked and I saw all the, these five-year-olds were all lying down under the table. I said, oh God, what's going on? And it was an art class. It wasn't an exercise class. And I went across and I asked her very brightly. I didn't want to underline or spoil anything, but I walked in and said, hi kids, what's going on? Well, this brilliant teacher had taken paper and taped it under the table and all the kids were lying there and they were painting under the table as if they were Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. I, I mean, I thought that was brilliant. To this day, I think that's one of the most inspired lesson plans for how to teach a five-year-old about Michelangelo and the Sistine ceiling. Um, and if I wanted to, this would be not be a 45 minute talk. This could be a three week seminar on all the things that I've learned from all the amazing and talented people I have had the privilege of working with over these last 25 years. And if we just celebrated our 25th year, uh, which amazes us. Um, so I think I've covered our past. Um, here's, here we are now. And um, we are, we had a decision to make in March. In fact, it was Friday, March 13th, Friday the 13th, appropriately enough, is when Laura Curran shut down uh, Nassau County because of COVID in 2020. And we had a meeting that Friday, my staff, we now have about 50 people on staff between teachers and um, staff members and department heads and so on. But we had a meeting just with the executive staff, about eight of us, what to do, what do we do? And some people felt that we should just, you know, maybe we should just wait it out. And I just, that, you know, sometimes you have a moment and it's, a, it's that fork in the road moment. And yeah, we could have, but I didn't feel good about it. I felt like if we, re, if we closed even for two weeks, we would never reopen. So I said, no. Um, and so I had our school director speak to the faculty and to see if there was any way we could get them to figure out how to teach their subject in a virtual setting online. That was one problem. The second problem was, would the parents cooperate? Would they, uh, would they consider that an appropriate and acceptable solution? Uh, most of the parents said yes, and we were able to do that. Some parents said no. So, you know, they later on, by the way, they all came back because later on it became apparent that virtual learning was going to be the wave. So um, we had every single class in our catalog online within a week. And I have to tell you, that was some project. These teachers are all to be, these, they're all dancers or singers or musicians, painters, cartoonists. I mean, go down the list, sculptors, ceramicists. Now, how do you teach ceramics virtually? You need the clay, you need the tools. We have a ceramics teacher. Her name is Judy Ansel. Um, she's, she's the ceramicist, by the way who was commissioned by the Firemen's Museum in New York to do a, uh, a tribute to all the firemen who perished in, uh, in the World Trade Center disaster. And so she, did, she etched portraits of every single one of those firemen into glass and it's mounted and it's still, it will always be uh, in that museum. She lived in Great Neck for many, many years and she and I became friends. And when I opened, she said, can I help? And she became our first ceramics teacher and remains the ceramics teacher. And she said, okay, let's talk. So I said, how about, she was ready to teach online, but she said, but how do I get the clay? And parents were terrified. No, we were locked down, nobody could come in. So picture a convoy of parents in their cars coming at a designated time to the front of the art center in that parking lot picking up a box that had their child's name on it that was completely sealed in plastic, taking it home, it included clay and tools. And then that night logging on or that afternoon logging on for the lesson with Jude, the very next day or the, within that week, finishing what they started and then bringing back what they had done in the same box with their child's name on it. And then she fired it in the kiln. And then they picked it up a third time. And at that time they picked up the next clay for the next lesson. 
it sounds cumbersome, I have to tell you. They were so happy to get the hell out of the house and show up at the art center and to be participating in a much more interactive way um, that nobody, nobody complained. And I thought it was ingenious and it required much more work on, obviously on the teacher's part. And she donated her time because she, she, had, um, she had the means to do so. So just quite remarkable. Uh, our dance teacher, we had cameras aimed at her feet you know, when she needed it and at her hands when she needed it. If you go on our website, you will see these kids dancing at our Festival of the Arts, which was a virtual performance of all these students between the artwork they did. And, and some of it was very cathartic. You see a lot of, of reactions to the COVID epidemic and the shutdown. Um, it's, it's just been quite remarkable. In addition to the school and everything else, we have had over the years, since 1995, since we opened, um, we have done outreach. So we have sent our teachers through different grants that helped us uh, into schools where these kids are not getting the arts, certainly not getting access to what we can provide. And, um, and including this ceramics teacher who's been known to haul hundreds of pounds of clay to schools in Flushing or out here um, in central um, Long Island, uh, just, just quite, quite amazing. The stories about the teachers are a separate story, but we were able to pivot and reinvent the art center as an online entity in a different way from just being in a website uh, to, to be an interactive online entity. And then gradually as the year progressed and they began to allow restaurants to open on the street, limited, so I called the mayors and I said, look, the parking lot is empty. Nobody's parking because nobody's going out. So can we have the parking lot so that we can have classes set up appropriately distanced, the teacher's happy to do it and obviously given the weather uh, permitting. And so we, to this minute, we have classes that will be taking place from May through uh, September uh, given the weather and we always have a, a, a rain date and they come and we have had full classes including yoga outdoors um, in the parking lot outside of our outside of our building right right there and the village cooperates by cordoning it off with appropriate you know um, what do they call them bollards so that you know there's no there's no danger to anybody who happens to want to park there's limited parking but not so limited these days and um, so that's, that's been the story in terms of what we've been doing to cope with, uh, with COVID. Then came the fact that it was our 25th anniversary. We had a big plan. We had so many good things planned for the 25th anniversary. Over the years, we've had some remarkable movie stars and theater people and famous artists. Larry Rivers came once to be honored. Um, Morton Gould was our first honoree. If you don't know who he was, um, he was a resident of Great Neck for 40 years, but he was a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, musician, composer, and, um, and he was also honored by the Kennedy Center in 1995. He got one of the Kennedy Center honors, and he was, he was great. When, I, when he heard what I was doing, he, um, he called me and he said, come talk to me. And he gave me advice. He told me how to deal with musicians and from a business perspective, how to organize concerts and, and what have you. And it's, he, was, he was a remarkable man. So he was our very first honoree. And we did it at that time at the Tilla Center. And um, we, just, we, just always, we just always interacted within the community. There was a time we had a salon series. And what was the salon series? Well, we didn't have a theater. We were in, we opened in 90, oh, so we opened in 1995 in the basement of St. Paul's Church. Why? Because St. Paul's Church had a, a couple of rooms for classrooms, but they also had an office uh, space for us. And they had this huge dance studio. I don't know how they ended up with a dance studio, but they did, complete with the mirrors, the bars, and the floor. So we rented it from them and we are now aboard and we met and we had a five-year plan. Well, guess what? We outgrew our five-year plan and ended up uh, 
1997, uh, moving to a space that was provided for us by a New York City philanthropist who had just bought the movie theater building and other assets. He owned the building that became the Atria on Cutter Mill. Cutter Mill? No, on Great Neck Road. And I, Mayor Rose Garten took me into the city, said, I got a new guy who wants accommodations. I want you to meet with him, see if you can do your presentation. Who knew that this is a man who supports, supported, passed away, who supported the arts in New York City. He was on the board of Lincoln Center Jazz. He was on the board of Carnegie. He was, he was a huge, and he looked at me after my presentation and he, and he said, he said that he was sorry that he didn't live in Great Neck because if he lived in Great Neck, I would have been all set. <laughs> I said, well, can you consider? No, I'm not moving to Great Neck. <laughs> so he gave me the opportunity um, to move our operations into the space where we are currently um, for the same rent. So we had now, now we acquired 5,000 square feet of space for the same rent we were paying for the three rooms at, um, in the basement of St. Paul's Church. I mean, a remarkable gift. When the adjacent space became available, we had the right of first refusal. He condoed the entire space so that we could own our space and he offered me the adjacent space. So we are today 10,000 square feet, which you, you, it's hard to imagine because when you come in, it looks like this, but then when you turn the corner, you realize it's a big, it's a big space. Um, so in 2003, we acquired the second half of, of the building where we built a theater and um, more classrooms and dance studios and a music studio and an open atrium area where we have school children who are bused in from the region. It's, it's quite a busy art center. It's, it's quite a busy art center. Fundraising has been an ongoing project. Um, we don't have an endowment. And um, I know that Shirley Romaine uh, had said that that was their biggest, that was what they had failed to do that they, they never thought that the community would not support them. So um, they never raised any money for tomorrow. And so that's why when the time came and they could sell their building for, I think it was $600,000 or something, they did. They sell this, if you've ever been in Young Israel, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous space. And that was the original art center in its previous incarnation. Um, the future, well, the first, the film festival has proven to be the tail that wags the dog because donors and sponsors love being affiliated with an international film festival. It definitely has put the uh, Art Center and the um, Gold Coast on the map. Now, why Gold Coast? Okay. We were looking for a name when we were going to adopt a new name to describe in a word we, we still had people in 19, uh, even in 2001, 2002, people asking if they're allowed to come because it's called the Great Neck Art Center. I said, oh, that's not good. We want this to be welcoming and not, it was just a geographical designation. It wasn't a limiting designation. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, at the turn of the last century, is anybody still listening to me? <laughs> I've been talking so long. Rona, are you there? I'm here. Uh, listen, I'll get the, I'll get the uh, what is that called? The hook? I'll get the coke when it's necessary. Don't worry. Okay. Yes, we're all listening. We're oh, all okay. Listening. Thank you. I, I, all of a sudden, it dawns on me. I'm talking to myself. We wanted to be quiet for you. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate it. But generally, if I'm sp when I speak in normal terms, I would have people in the room and I get some, you know, it's like being a comedian with no audience. You don't know what yeah. you're. <laughs> You don't know what's yeah, everybody's going on. also muted so we're that's okay give uh, you I will I will ratchet through the rest of my little presentation <laughs> um, let, me, let me just now I have to remember where I was why uh, gold coast ah why gold coast <laughs> at the turn of the last century um, there was no air conditioning for anybody so what were, were then the millionaires which today would be billionaires uh, would move their families they, to the weekend, the summer cottages where they would go for the summer season. Everybody's familiar with Newport. People are less familiar with the mansions that line, those of us who live here know them, but the ones that line the, um, the coast uh, on the North Shore. 
And that would have been the Vanderbilts, the Guggenheims, the Chryslers, um, you know, Ohiga Castle was, what's his name, the financier. Uh, so you, have, you had all of these people, and if they were coming for the season, they weren't going to be without their entertainment. So they would invite guests who, who would entertain them. And so all these performers would come out. And having come out, they began to like it. And that's how we got all those performers to live in Great Neck, who would then go out to, um, to the Guggenheim's mansion, uh, Falaise, or to, to uh, Ohika, or wherever it was. And, and that's how it began to be, um, it started to evolve. The performers called it the Gold Coast, because all these millionaires lived there. So they said, ah, that's the gold, that's the gold coast. They could make their money there, and these people already had the money, and it, it was known as a rich, financially rich place. There is a Gold Coast in Australia named Gold Coast for different reasons. There's a Gold Coast in Chicago for different reasons. The irony for us is that when we post and receive films as submissions for our film festival, um, for which, by the way, we get thousands of submissions, we have gotten submissions from Australia, from filmmakers who say, and by the way, I'd like to come to the opening. And then we realize, oh yeah, you think it's in Sydney. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so we have to, no, 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 we're in New York. We have had people from England, filmmakers from England come to Great Neck and discover Great Neck because they had a film that was accepted and they were excited to be part of the film um, experience of the premiere and festival. So suddenly, suddenly we're known around the world. So I think sometimes that we're known better around the world than we are in our own community. So it's just ironic, but, um, but we have gotten, we had gotten some significant sponsorships as a result of that kind of exposure. Um, people want, businesses want their, their companies to be associated with an upscale um, brand, which Gold Coast has become, and with a brand that has outreach to all kinds of communities and populations, which we also have. Uh, so that's, that's where we are now. In terms of the future, well, that's anybody's guess. I can tell you what I was hoping. I, I had hoped that um, the downtown, now tell me any of you that you think the downtown looks great. <laughs> Raise your hand, yes. Yeah, right? Um, so I believe that, um, the downtown needs a lot of help. And in, in, in order to revitalize a downtown, you have to bring people in. And unfortunately, because of COVID, that's not happening. And the, well, but it will. I, I do have every confidence that it will. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it absolutely will. But what won't come back are some of the restaurants and stores that we've lost. So what attracts them back well, I'm thinking that it turns out that the entire building that the Art Center lives in has just recently been purchased by a new owner. Um, we own our, we used to own our space. We sold our space just to take away any, if anybody ever heard about this, it was in the papers. Our space, oh, how many of you know that Carnegie Hall, the building is not owned by Carnegie Hall, the not-for-profit entity? because the history of Carnegie Hall was the model by which I convinced the town of North Hempstead, uh, then supervisor John Kamen, who is now the president of the art center, by the way, um, I convinced him to adopt that model in helping the art center go forward because um, Carnegie Hall was scheduled for demolition. Andrew Carnegie had, had died, his widow had sold the building to um, a, a one of these impresarios, I forget who it was, was it Saul Hurek? I don't remember. But anyway, and he continued to mount all kinds of performances and stuff at Carnegie Hall. And then when he died, in 19, I think it was 1960 or 61, she decided to sell it to a developer who was ready to give her serious money for that building. When Jackie Kennedy, um, Isaac Stern, and all kinds of philanthropists in New York City rallied together to form um, a union of people to save Carnegie Hall. I, I mean, I remembered I was in school, but um, I'm sure that anybody who lived in this area knew about it. They created uh, a situation where they incorporated Carnegie Hall, the entity, as a not-for-profit registered at New York State. 
they sold the building Carnegie Hall to New York City, the municipality. I don't remember who the mayor was at the time. New York City owned, owns to this day Carnegie Hall, the building, and as part of the deal, um, is responsible for the insurance, the maintenance, everything to do with Carnegie Hall, the building. Carnegie Hall, the entity, the not-for-profit, is responsible for their own fundraising, is responsible for the programming, is responsible for everything else to do with the management of Carnegie Hall. And the New York City, the municipality, has three voting seats on their board. So that's been the relationship ever since the 1960s. Town of North Hempstead, and John is a, a lawyer and a good one, and uh, he was able to persuade them that buying the Gold Coast Art Center building, we were then Great Neck Art Center building, um, because basically what I was doing is I was having to raise about $100,000 a year in grants and private donations just to pay for the roof. It's a flat roof. Anybody who has a flat roof knows a flat roof is just a headache waiting to happen during rainy season and snow season. And we had leaks coming in. It, it, and the, the landlord who owned the, the building was an extremely, was a bad person and um, took advantage of the fact that we were the only tenants underneath that roof. So he never repaired it and told us, you know, go fly a kite. So we ended up having to raise the money for that, for that roof among other repairs that had to be made. And it was, it was hurting me personally hurting me to have to raise money, not for programming and not for the benefit of, of our mission, but just for bricks and mortar. It was just terrible. So in consultation with the board, um, we and when the offer was made by the town, and by the way, they bought it for a song, um, we gave up our equity in that building to sell it to the town for the right to live there for a dollar a year and they now do all the maintenance and they now own the space and they now do the plumbing and all the, all the repairs related to <laughs> and the roof. So um, the bane of my existence for many years. So, so that freed us up so that, you know, when you take $100,000 a year off of, your, off of your, as a line item in your budget, you suddenly, you're suddenly feeling much better. And I was at that point concerned about legacy. Who the hell would ever want my job if that was one of the burdens that came with it, which was raising that kind of money? So for that particular purpose. So, um, and I'm happy to tell you that I have some brilliant people working, uh, young people working behind me who, um, who are able to manage the art center and who will take it into the next, uh, the next generation's life. And I believe that the art center is a secure entity Maybe not at this location, because if we outgrow this location, I don't know where it's going to go. But um, we would love to have that building, or at least the two movie theaters next to it, which are for sale, by the way. So um, we're trying to get some people who are community-minded, interested, so that, I mean, picture, picture that as um, an art, a true art, like from top to bottom, have actual artists in studios where you could go visit the studios the way they do um, in Brooklyn, where you have galleries, not just one, where you have two movie theaters and a legitimate theater where you could actually have productions, stand up comedy, um, where, where you could have education and, and the arts in a constant daily offering that would attract people from all over the place. Uh, it would attract restaurants, it would attract retail, it would attract a lot of things. So from a business perspective, it would be great for the town, it would be great for our downtown. Um, and that is, I think, you know, something for the future. For the moment, we're happy that we survived COVID. So uh, that I think fulfills my promise to Rona that I would talk about the past, the present and the future. <laughs> yes. She did, she did, she gets a gold star. Does any... <laughs> And we really thank you. Um, so many things that I didn't know. And I, so I would like um, <clears throat> to un unmute, <laughs> do we unmute. And is there anybody who either has a, a reminiscent from uh, their days at the, uh, at the Gold Coast that can add to your storytelling or who um, has a question? So um, where are you, Carol? I see Brenda. Brenda's part of the art center. Hi, Brenda. 
<laughs> but let me just ask uh, Barbara to, Barbara, let me ask Carol. Carol, where are you? I'm here. Could we unmute everybody? Can yeah, you they can unmute themselves unmute when yourself, they're ready to call. Please. Yeah, would anybody, um, ladies? I would like to say that the yeah. film society that you had for a few years was my main cultural attraction in Great Neck. And that there were extremely interesting speakers in the beginning. I haven't gone the last few years. So I thank you for that. Thank you for the thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, do we have any? I can't see. Let's let's put the whole thing. Okay. Yes. Does anybody have something they'd like to say? Yes. I do. Okay. Who is second? Okay. Okay, Carol. Uh, so um, you can't see me, or maybe you can. I don't know. Um, I see you. So everything that you have said is so close to my heart because I grew up in Roslyn and my mother's an artist. She's 92 years old and she, I, you know, I was brought up around an artist and that says so much. <laughs> so it was, it's, and still is very, very important in my life. Um, what you've done is fantastic. It, it, makes my heart filled with excitement really um because so many times you know when my my son is now 30 but when he was in school they took away all that they killed all the budgets i grew up he grew up in queens and he had none of that and if he didn't have my mother who is was a paper maker when he was growing up and um to, to have that fulfillment, which used to be when I went to school, we had all of that. It, it was a huge thing. And, and to see what you guys did and what everybody's been doing since last year to fulfill the need is just fantastic. Uh, um, I'm thrilled that you came to talk to us. I it, just feel really good about it. And I just wanted to let you know that I it's appreciate amazing. That. Um, By the way, yeah. By the way, do you know why the arts took a nosedive in the curriculum after I think, when was Sputnik, 1958? Ah, oh, yes. So after Sputnik went up, that's when the budget changed. It's the government, the federal government, Eisenhower decided we need more math and we need more science and withdrew funding from the arts and from the humanities. So it's no coincidence that the arts started to decline within the curricula of the various and sundry schools. It took a generation, but it successfully managed to kill the arts Yeah, um, because of Sputnik. Well, um, I was lucky when I was in high school to have all this still. And my you son, too. unfortunately he did not. And um, you know, you have to get it from other places. And, and I just, um, I just very impressed by your talk and I was online while I was listening to you also. And uh, um, I'm sending you an email by the way, so thank you'll you. know who it's from. So thank, thank you. you really for being here. It, it's meant so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's wonderful. And uh, we will put a link. Uh, we, we, will, we, will just, we will put a link uh, uh, to the book group, uh, cultural group. Uh, and uh, for them to, uh, with your website and uh, anything else you'd like to. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me by email, I'm Regina Gill, R-E-G-I-N-A-G-I-L. I think it's up there on the my yeah. screen there, at Gold Coast Arts, A-R-T-S dot org. Especially if you're thinking of being a sponsor or a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> even if you she will definitely get back to you. <laughs> even, Thanks, even, even, if you, even if you even if you when you go to vote or when you go to talk to your legislators you tell yeah. them that they should support the art center absolutely because, you know whatever help we can get it, it word of mouth pressure on our, our public mm -hmm. officials who are not necessarily culturally literate um is a very helpful thing okay thank definitely. you thank you and uh, 
anytime you want to uh, come and tell us about anything that's going on, we are always happy to hear from you. And, you know, just even if you want a, a highlight spot and, and talk about a, a specific program, this is, we, we'd be, you know, we're all local. So we're, we're ready to- um, That's great. Cooperate. I'm, I'm happy to be in, in constant touch with you, Rona, and with all of these delightful ladies. Thank you. Thank you have a you. wonderful thank follower you. too. So. Okay. So thank so you. Thank you. And uh, if anybody want to stay for one minute, I just want to have, Regina does not have to, they, although we would love to have you. But I, was thinking, <laughs> I wanted to, if you wanted to read books with us, <laughs> you'll give a, I will definitely look into Hedy Lamar. I know I saw it and I'm hoping maybe somebody will, uh, and I will, I will share lists of books that we've had book authors on. And oh, if you look on my website, as I told you initially, we I'm have had some outstanding authors and um, I've done the interviews myself. So if you're ever interested, you know, let us know and we can give you the links. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to log off now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.